yes, now I think this uh, recording is getting resumed. Anyway, so I was talking to you about this, uh, this article which I shared with you. Uh, today, the main crux of our meeting would be the conceptual things. Uh, I'll try my best that I should complete these conceptual uh, discussion today. Uh, so that the next week when we meet, we start going into applying these theories in the real life and also learning more application-based uh, theories. But I think the understanding of these basic concepts is very vital for everybody. That's why uh, this is my first point of discussion. Yeah, so we, we start with the, we started about the production possibility curve last time. And today I want to take you to the basics of uh, two uh, very important branches of economics. Uh, one is microeconomics and the second one is macroeconomics. Uh, first of all, uh, the micro and the macroeconomics, this distinction is very much uh, subjective in the sense that something could be micro, but at the same time, it can be reckoned as macro as well. But to understand the microeconomics, there's a definition there. Micro is a very, the unit of analysis. What we study, what we keep in our mind when we analy analyzing something is an individual person or an individual firm. So very basic, uh, one company, one person. We are not adding up. We are not making any collectivism. When some individual company or one individual firm, its behavior, its business, its cost, its profits, its revenue, its overheads, when they are studied, we are in the domain of microeconomics. How a company should fix its price, how the price should be determined. What is the minimum cost of the company? What should be the minimum price which the firm must charge to remain competitive in the market? These are microeconomic issues. But then, macroeconomic is not far away. Macroeconomic is when you are adding up all the individuals, all the firms, all the companies, that becomes the macroeconomic phenomena. So for example, when I say that in the country, the oil sector is going down a lot, or no bank is willing to give loans to the mining industry, or uh, there is a special privilege by the state in the form of tax incentives to the uh, non-conventional energy sector. Or the state is giving some tax incentives to the self-employed people in the whole country. I'm talking about collection of people, collection of companies, collection of industries, collection of sectors. In that case, this phenomena becomes macroeconomic. Like the definition says, the macroeconomics is a major branch of economics that deals with the performance structure and behavior of the economy as a whole. The full economy is taken into account. And it's also called uh, as science of aggregates or the science of collection because you are collecting all the people together or all the companies together. If I say, uh, there's one IT company in Uvascula and its revenue is uh, 20 million euros a year. And then we have 200 companies in Finland. And when you multiply, and let's say that this is the average revenue, then you can make an estimate 12 uh, million times 200. Okay, this is hopefully 
the macroeconomic production of these small IT companies in Finland. So basically, the macroeconomic is collectivism. When we are adding up the companies or the firms or the other business or non-business entities. Hmm? Macroeconomic affects everybody. If one company's price goes up, or its cost goes down, or its revenue shrinks, probably we will not be so alarmed unless you are working for the company and you have a fear of losing job, or you are buying the production of that company and you are in a fear that probably you will not get the supply. But that doesn't send any alarm bells to the full economy. But when you hear the news that the inflation is predicted to go up from 1% to 3% in Finland, when you hear the news that the rate of interest will is likely to go up, when you hear the news that the euro may lose its value against American dollar, then it's affecting almost all the companies, all the individuals directly or indirectly. Hence, we are talking about macroeconomic phenomena. When Euro becomes cheaper against dollar, okay, it's not only, it's not affecting one individual or one company. It will be affecting all the individuals, all the companies who are having some, something to do with the foreign exchange transactions. So when a phenomena is hitting, across the board, all the companies, all the firms, all the entities, then it becomes macroeconomic. Inflation is a macroeconomic problem. The labor strike in a company is a microeconomic problem. The country needs complete technological overhaul is a macroeconomic problem. A company, individual firms, operations have collapsed because its production structure is very old fashioned, is a microeconomic problem. So the word, the only thin line between micro and macro is the collection as against uh, standalone uh, analysis. Yes, sir. Well, that depends upon the scale of the problem. If there is a, let's say, as I said before, that the line, the thin line between micro and macro is very thin. <laughs> the line between micro and macro is very thin. Okay, uh, if there's an oil crisis, and it's only affecting one company, one firm, or it may be very at the very local level, I would reckon it a micro problem. But if it is upscaling, if it is affecting all the importers, exporters, all right, and the country and the state has to come in and do some intervention, then it becomes a macroeconomic problem. Okay, if the exchange rate goes up, mm -hmm, if the euro becomes expensive against dollar. Right, and then one company in Finland who is importing is very angry. Uh, sorry, uh, who's exporting is very angry. It's a microeconomic problem. But if all the companies are cribbing, complaining, then it becomes a macroeconomic problem. It also happens that if some problem is at the very basic level, it's more micro, but when it spreads fast, it becomes macro. Mm -hmm. uh, Before I give this example, I think I talk about something that if the price is going up, if the price is going up, or if I say, if the inflation is going up, first of all, please tell me one thing. What is the difference? Can I call the increase in price as inflation? Have you heard the word inflation? Inflation, yeah. And you know the price increase, the price rise? Are they synonyms or they're different? Is price rise and inflation are same or they are different?
money, two birds look like more fair, but more uh, on the celery, I make them so much easier at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, they should do like a surprise show and uh, uh, like go around the celery. So, do you say that the price increase at least is a common phenomena? Uh, so, not, not common. I think that in a, like in inflation, it improves two points. Uh huh. Okay, I take your point. Yeah, fair enough. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. Very good. Yes. I think the old lessons from the medicine apply. Basically, the inflation when people don't have jobs, don't have money, the mm -hmm. price will go down because so if you look at the real estate market in the United States, or if you look at the economy of what happened in 2007. Mm -hmm. They had over demand on, on the oversupply on demand, so of course the price is going down, which mm -hmm. affects the by the inflation. Okay. Yes, gentlemen, you, you want to say something? Very good point. I think you you folks have given a fantastic point. But before that, uh, I have to wait a sec. Where is this? So if the price increase is taking place, not only for a day or two or a week or so, but for comparatively longer time, this is called inflation. The third element of inflation, if the price of one or two products increase, it's not called inflation. In general, the prices of all the commodities and services increases, that is called inflation. So inflation is general price rise, not a particular price rise. So if the price of one product or two products, just because of some X, Y, Z reasons increases, you will not call it inflation. To call it inflation, it has to be number one, increase in the price. Number two, the price increase should be for a long time. It should not be a temporary phenomena. And number three, the price rise should be spreaded across the goods and services. These are three essentials of inflation. And then, uh, as you said, that when the prices are increasing, number one, for all the products for the long time, what happens? Then the value of your wallet become lower. The price, the value of the money drops. So the drop in the value of money is a consequence of inflation, all right? The money supply goes down. Hmm? We used to have an economist, what a fantastic, he won Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, his name is Irving Fisher. And he said, very famous quote, that ceteris paribus, other things being equal, double the money supply, double will be the prices, and half will be the value of money. Imagine you all are getting some X amount of salary, right? And there is certain quantity of gross domestic product in this country, GDP, national income. And if all of you start getting double salary, I mean, there is a, uh, you know what happened? Uh, this, this would lead us to another discussion called money illusion illusion i l l u s i o n illusion how there's one company the labor is very angry and the labor says our wages are very low the management bow down they increase the wages but the management is very very clever they push they add the increased wages to the cost and hence, they start demanding more price from the customers. And when they see, when the neighboring companies see that, oh yes, they, are, they have won the wage war against management, why don't we do it? And then they also pursue the same thing. And then they also get the wage hikes. And the labor is very happy. But the labor doesn't know that the labor is cheated. How? Because only the weight of the wallet has increased. 
there's no real increase in the supply of goods and services that has not increased because the management has increased the cost uh, the the price the increased cost is now part of the new price and with the new price because the price goes up demand shrinks nobody is buying more goods and services as a result there's a problem the problem is that there's a more inflation the price increases the value of the money even though you have the very heavy wallets but that doesn't make any sense the price the size of the nominal income is not the indicator of your development often sometime we have a family chats we have in the family parties there are three or four generations people sitting together and they they're having chat and one one common uh, point of discussion can be hey how was the lifestyle in 50s or 40s or 60s and then the those old people would say that even though we used to have less income that time but i think we were having better lifestyle than you you may disagree with them but they have a point at least so the, the idea they are trying to make is that with one euro well there was no euro at that time uh, with one local domestic currency they could have bought more goods and services right now this is good or bad is it that's a separate phenomena which is better which is not but the point i'm trying to make is that if there is no increase if there is no increase in the output income the gdp expansion if we are not moving away wait a sec where is that remember we were talking about the production possibility curve on other day if let's say we are on the blue line and people's wages go up right then this is not a real success the real success is that when the country's production capacity your gdp your national income your income output employment not in monetary terms but in the real terms in kilos in quintals in liters in tons in gallons when that improves so this is the real uh, economic development if you are on the given ppc and the only thing which is increasing is the monetary income the nominal income that is not economic progress hmm? now imagine in a country every year the gdp is increasing by 2% i'll come to you the gdp is increasing by 2% but the inflation is 5% the gdp the national income is increasing at 2% but the inflation is at 5% it means that your wallet your income the notes the blueprints which you have the greenbacks they are, they are increasing by 2% you were earning 1000 euros last year this year you're earning your your wage is 1000 euros and 20 uh, 1020 euros but the inflation is 5% you are losing your your nominal income is 2% more but your real income is 3% down do you know why did you listen to my example carefully your nominal income your cash income is increasing by 2% a year but the inflation is 5% 5% minus 2% 3% 3% of what 3% of cost rise is more than increase in your income so basically you are losing 3% so you are you feel that you are getting richer but you are getting poorer this is called money illusion labor have the money illusion i'm not saying that the labor should not go for more wage hikes of course it's their right but they also should see that hey this increase is net of inflation or gross of inflation if that increase is is on top of the inflation rate in the country great but if this increase is basically 
below the rate of inflation, then we are fooling ourselves. That increase is not the real increase. So therefore, when you talk about inflation, uh, you need to talk about it, uh, many other dynamics. Yes, what's your point? Precisely. Yes. Uh, there are some uh, movies I don't remember, but I watch a few uh, about the hyperinflation. Yeah. Uh, hyperinflation was one of the reasons of the world war. Uh, because then you become, when there is an economic problem, be it inflation or immigrants or whatever, then we become more conservative. And once we become more conservative, we start getting more, you know, touchy and itchy. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that. Uh, I, th I think it was yesterday, I posted an article on, uh, wait a sec, uh, the same article which I discussed with you uh, about this future financial crisis, I shared on Yamk uh, Facebook page. And there are some comments, there is a one example of Argentina, which this girl, uh, my ex student, she has sent me, uh, she commented on it, and she gave it real life that how this uh, inflation has been a big problem in Argentina, but Argentina is not the one example. Zimbabwe uh, has seen a 500 plus inflation rate on daily basis. Every day, the prices are increasing by 500%. So the point I'm trying to make is that it's not just because of price rise. It's something more. And that is the span, the time length of inflation and how widespread the inflation is. I'm sure if the, in Zimbabwe, the price rise have been for two months and only for cookies, there would have been no financial crisis. I mean, the cookies can increase by 500, 100%, who cares? You know? But if it is for all the, for the whole, whole economy, then yes, it makes a big sense. You wanna say something? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Well, that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, it's like saying that who is leading to what? Uh, is it the tail or the head of the cat which is <laughs> leading the direction? Uh, sometimes the increased cost push the price and sometimes increased prices push the cost. Mm -hmm. Let's say you are a company and uh, let's say that there is no there is a shortage of certain commodity in a country, yeah? You are buying it, imported, and the price is very high. Because of, and many people are consuming it, what will happen? Your income is not rising to that level, so your, your weekly or the monthly budget is disturbed. Now here the price is leading to the cost, but then the cost can also lead to the price. How? The wages, like the example I gave you, that the workers are asking for more wages, you accept it, wage is a part of the cost, cost is a part of the price. When wage goes up, cost goes up, price goes up. So it depends who leads who. But I tell you something. Uh, I know once, uh, was it last year? Uh, a student asked me, uh, Shab, what should be the inflation rate acceptable? I mean, what should be? Uh, when, when the inflation, okay, let's imagine that the price is increasing, price is increasing for all the commodities for six months and so, uh, but is it all lost? My answer is no. We have speeds of inflation. If the inflation is one to 2% a year, guess what? It's a very, very healthy sign. 
Hmm? Do you get my point? If the inflation is one to 2% a year, then it can be considered to be a very healthy sign. Guess what? If somebody is paying the price, high price, somebody is also taking the high price. And who is that? The business people, the traders. They are the people who want their revenue to grow. And when they get more prices from consumers, but it's not so high that people are now stopping consumption or reducing consumption, one or 2%. Assuming that the cost is same, they people feel very happy about it. Who? The traders. They don't want to be felicitated in a, in, a, in, a, in a big show and given the rewards. No, for them, the increase in the price is a reward. But then the question is, how much? How much is too much? Historically, if the inflation is 1% to 2% a year, it has no backlash. It doesn't demand consumers bad reaction. But if the inflation is three to 5%, this is called mild inflation. When you can feel the heat already. If the inflation goes beyond 5%, but below 10%, it's called walking inflation. If it is more than 10%, but below 20%, below 20%, 20% inflation. This is called a running inflation. If it is below 20%, uh, if it is above 20% and below 50%, this inflation is called galloping inflation, gallop. You know this, have you seen the horse gallop? It's called galloping inflation. The big jump, have you seen the equestrian uh, events? The horse comes and jumps over. Uh, hurdles, yeah. Uh, not a trot, uh, but a but a jump. And if the inflation is beyond 50, 60, there is no limit. That is called hyperinflation. And Germany and many countries have witnessed hyperinflation. I just gave the example of Zimbabwe, 500 plus percent inflation, not on yearly basis, on daily basis. What would you call it? 500% on daily basis, count it for full year, how many percentages it become? Awful, hyperinflation. Hmm? Mexico has witnessed hyperinflation. I think Argentina has uh, confronted this problem on several occasions. Uh, mid 90s, not mid 90s, wait a sec, uh, 1997, those five, six, seven countries known as the Asian Tigers. Which countries? Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, Hong Kong. They witnessed uh, 80 to 150% of inflation. Okay, so the world has seen these kind of situations when the inflation can be beyond, uh, you know, any control. Okay, that is why uh, it's like a drugs. Well, no drug is good, but one to two percent could be used in the medicines, right? Uh, but if you are not controlling it, it goes beyond, uh, it could be a problem. Hmm? I know in some cases, the, in the serious problems, the patients are administered those drugs, but to a milder level, not, but, but not beyond that level, level. They don't want to, that could be uh, catastrophic. So the point is that we need to understand the economic phenomena, but we also need to understand which inflation is good, which inflation is bad, okay? So inflation is essentially a macroeconomic problem. It's not a microeconomic problem because inflation is affecting almost all the sectors, all the companies, all the industries. Uh, examples, some more examples of macroeconomic uh, policies, not the problem. It's not always a problem. Examples are 
examples of the macroeconomic policy is if you want to see exactly what is macroeconomic policy on day to day basis go to the central bank of the country's website and click functions you get my point if you want to see the uh, if you want to see the um, monetary policy in reality then we can go to let's say bank of finland suomi panki if you want to see sorry okay yeah 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 this is the this is monetary policy this is what macroeconomic is if you click this link and you find out that how a uh, central bank of finland is running its monetary policy on what basis all right then everything everything you see underneath monetary policy Uh, is a fiscal all, all these things are basically macroeconomic issues so basically everything on this website is macroeconomic okay uh yeah coming back to i think i shared with you uh, i don't know when did uh, that an economy has two ways to control two remote controls to control the economy one is called monetary policy and the second is called fiscal policy fiscal policy the countries in which the state is very active state is not only a referee of the match but also a player in those countries fiscal policy is very vital very important on the other hand the countries where the free market mechanism is more in circulation more prevalent the state doesn't make uh, everything basically the state is only a watchdog uh, an umpire a referee a, a, a kind of watchdog supervisor in vigilator in those countries monetary policy is far more important than the fiscal policy for example if you're living in the us then the monetary policy is more important than fiscal policy because the state is not taking part unlike finland uh, in the us the state is not taking part into the economic activities on a regular basis so it depends upon the 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 ideological uh, background of the country in finland i can imagine that state is super 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 active hmm? so in 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 finland fiscal policy is no way less important than the monetary policy however the word of caution is that the monetary policy is easy to implement it it's it goes very fast but the fiscal policy can take ages before the results are produced so by speed monetary policy is far quicker than the fiscal policy but these are two examples of uh, macro economic and i think i wrote a note somewhere yeah we will discuss more in details but i would still like to discuss with you what is fiscal policy write down if you have piece of paper fiscal policy is about the public debt it's about the public debt public means not the one person borrowing but the whole but the full state the country is is borrowing from the people from the public it's about public debt comma public expenditure expenditure 
literature on the public, like, like roads or dams, bridges, uh, hospitals. Look at this uh, Hippos 2020 project. It's a, it's a public expenditure. Comma, uh, taxation, taxation, and, and deficit. It's a tongue twister. So fiscal policy, uh, fiscal policy is comprising of public debt, public expenditure, taxation, and deficit financing. The monetary policy, oh, what happened to this? The monetary policy is simple. It is, it is about supply of money, and the cost of money. This is the fiscal policy and the monetary policy. Question is, who runs this? The fiscal policy, public debt, Ministry of Finance, public expenditure, maybe infrastructure, taxation, again, Ministry of Finance. So basically all the ministries, you know the ministries, for example, if the army is buying some weapons, that is also public expenditure, right? You get my point? So all the ministries, Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Environment, all their expenses and their revenues, that is part of fiscal policy. Right? Who runs it? Ministries of the state. Basically, the government. And who runs the monetary policy? The central bank of the country. You can say that, why can't central bank of the country uh, not be in the control of the state? Well, of course it is. I will not say full control, but it's a, it has an impact. You get my point? But Bank of Finland is still an autonomous institution. It's not a ministry. Ministry of Finance is a ministry, but not Central Bank of Finland. Or for that matter, any country or any central bank. The Federal Ministry of USA is a ministry. State, tax, uh, I mean the government. But the Federal Reserve Bank system is not ministry. In fact, in, in US, there is no one central bank of the country. They have many, many central banks. It's a, it's a federation of several uh, central banks. That is called FRS, Federal Reserve System. Even some small islands like St. Lucia, they have their own uh, Federal Reserve. Okay, so we need to distinguish between the two. What is public debt? Hmm? Remember, the one purpose of this course is to get familiar with all these concepts. It's very important. It's very important. You will not learn for the rest of the program all this concept. It's only here when you will be having more. Uh, do you know something about the public debt? Public debt. Debt. You know what is debt? Public. Okay. And what is private? Break. <laughs> break. Who said break? <laughs> hmm? I have one more yoga posture to do. Yeah. <laughs> Are you all in here? All right. Okay. All right. So we have uh, uh, 